Okay, everybody seems to be coming in. Yeah. Let me uh, call up the texts. Hopefully this will work. Some of you, I'd have to do this in the last time we talked all the time. At least, uh, you know, if I have it, let's say an hour and a half session with a solution, I can almost count it at least once. One of us is going to have to pull the other one back. Yeah, this is frustrating. Not that much of a big deal. It takes two seconds. You just press yeah. the exit button and then you press the go back button. Maybe not two seconds, 30 seconds, but it certainly isn't a big deal. Okay. All right. All right, let's try once again sharing the screen. A little bigger, hopefully. <laughs> Yeah, I can't. Oh, there we go. All right. All right. Um, this is, there we go. Um, now everyone should see Parashat Bashalach. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. All right. Yeah. yeah, okay. So, Shell, Shell, you're here, right? Yes, yes. Okay. I think we lost Susie. All so right, I, Shell. I, I finished reading that paragraph. Well, let's do it again. All right. Now when Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them by way of the land of the Philistines, although it was nearer. For God say the people may have a change of heart when they see war and return to Egypt. So God led the people roundabout by way of the wilderness at the Sea of Reeds. Okay, so instead of taking them right up the coastal road, God turns them into the wilderness. And um, this whole thing about what's the big deal, they're going to see war, what war? And uh, just to very quickly bring in a commentary, um, also, I think you have to see Derech doesn't mean the road through, it means the road to. To, so yes. Derech Eres Pushtim is the road to Eres Pushtim. Derech Haman Bar Yamsuk is the road towards to. Yamsuk. Eventually, right. if you stay on the road, you'll get there. But it's not like if Yamsuk is right around the corner, if, if we understand it to be the reason right. see. So, um... Again, here just uh Shell, would you like to continue? Can you read this here? Yeah, starting where? Um, here, Exodus 13, 17, by way of the land of the Philistines. Oh, this sure. is just Sarna's comment. So we sure. understand the context of what's going on. Oh, sure. The shortest land route from the Nile Delta to Canaan. It was the southern segment of the thousand mile, sixteen hundred kilometer international artery of transportation that led up to Pigo into Asia Minor. Brenda. Is ringing. Uh, Talk about Brenda. Okay. Uh, right. to Asia, into Asia Minor and then on to Mesopotamia. Beginning at the Egyptian fortress city of Tajaru, Sile, the highway followed the shoreline fairly closely, except where the shifting sand dunes and the land formation dictated otherwise. The army of Tutmos III took 10 days to cover the 150 mile, 240 kilometer distance to Gaza. The Egyptian name for this part of the road was the Way of Horus. It was the standard route followed by the pharaohs for incursions into Asia. And well, the pharaohs were considered to be the living embodiments on earth well, 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 of the god Horus. Okay, so that's in that the, uh, the road across uh, the northern Sinai follows exactly, literally within meters of where that is. I was involved in excavations 
1973, in January 73, at Bir al-Abad, and it was just on the road. Yep. Okay, so now, again, we have to understand, so that's, you know, as, as Rabbi Zucker said, that's, you know, the direct route still today. Um, but now uh, we have to understand a little bit more what, um, well, actually, that he keeps going on here to talk about the uh, the route. But the question is, you know, when they see war, why would they see war going out in the quickest way to the land of Israel? And uh, shall continue here in 1317 when they see war. Okay, since the days of Pharaoh Seti I, the coastal road to Canaan had been heavily fortified by the Egyptians. A chain of strongholds, way stations, reservoirs, and wells dotted the area as far as Gaza, the provincial capital. Many of these are pictured in great detail in the reliefs on the exterior of the walls of the Temple of Amun at Karnak in the plain of Thebes, and they are also mentioned in the Egyptian uh, papyrus. Excavations at Del El Bala in the Gaza Strip unearthed an Egyptian garrison fortress, the components of which bear a striking, a striking correspondence to those on the Karnak reliefs. It is quite clear that it was the better part of wisdom for the Israelites to have avoided the way of the land of the Philistines. They thereby avoided having to contend with the strongly entrenched Egyptian forces on what would have been hopelessly unequal terms. Okay, so now we understand why God may take them on a circuitous route to Eretz Israel, not the direct route, and uh, apparently for good reason that uh, it could yeah. very much destroy. Yeah, yes. The Finish. assumption of the verse, though, is the police team have already migrated into the country to the point where they're a military threat. I, I don't see this as what Sean is explaining it. I think if you say Derek Harris pushed him, then you know, that means the push team are already a threat. They're not just the advanced guard like they were in the time of Avram Avinu. They're more like enough people to represent the threat like they were in the time of Shimshon. So, you know, after all, it's really we're talking 100 years from the time that Shimshon is going to be fighting them. So um, I, I see Shimshon as early in the period of the judges, not late, because remember, the territory is being fought over is the original Nachala of Dan. Not the dominant, but they end, end up in. So even though Shimshon's story is late in the book, the events being recited there or, or, or de described there took place early on in, in, in the period of the judges. So if that's the case, I would assume that Derek Harris pushed him is exactly the road, road to where the pushed him have already entrenched themselves. Yehoshua. Say for your sure already talked about the push to, as a group that's already entrenched themselves. So I, I can just as easily see this as saying the push Tim will make war on them, not that the Egyptian garrison fortresses are going to make war. The Egyptians, are, if the, uh, the way to our story is being told, the Egyptians just get out of their wits and the Pharaoh orders them to leave the Israelites alone, which he certainly would be doing at this point then it's very unlikely that they will make any trouble. It's like after the Second World War, Japanese had forces all over the place. But as soon as Emperor Hirohito, you know, broadcast the surrender, you know, wherever Japanese forces were, they surrendered without any problems whatsoever. So I, I really don't see what, you know, what, the way Son is presenting this, I don't think is shot. Okay. Okay. All right. Rabbi so, Papi, I'm going to have to leave you because two of my granddaughters just walked into the house. Mazel enjoy. <laughs> enjoy. We're probably Shabbat a couple shalom. of great grandchildren. Okay, Shell. Yes. So uh, uh, chronologically, the exodus would have been before the uh, Philistines arrived to the coast. 
because that's under Ramses the uh, Third. After uh, that's like 1197, usually thought, and uh, the the time of the Exodus is thought to be about a century or 90 years before that. Yeah. So Ramses the Second. You know, I uh, Dr. Sarner was my teacher. <laughs> You know, this has kind of been ingrained in me, so I, I kind of take that perspective, and I assume that the readers, the initial readers of the uh, Torah, would have understand understood that reality. But you know, it is called Derech Eretz Blish Demon could very well. You know, the point is that it's not a safe route; that the Israelites would have encountered some type of military opposition, whether it were from Egypt uh, for Egyptian garrisons or already uh, the police team in, in installing themselves in the land. Okay. All right. So now the Israelites went up armed out of the land of Egypt. And okay. Moses, that, by the way, is a very difficult phrase. Yeah, of course. Um, where yeah. how, how, where did they get the ar armament to to go well there are a couple of things first of all they did despoil the egyptians they so did, yeah. you know, they okay. did despoil the egyptians oh right okay so you know where did they get all of the gold and yeah. the copper and everything else that they used but it only says gold. The it only says gold and copper it doesn't say uh guns or or they didn't, well, they didn't guns have any then, guns but, so that's... but yeah but it doesn't say uh, things for um, making war. I mean, they would probably only have close combat things, maybe knives, I guess. Unless the translation of Hamushim is not really armed. And that is how some commentators have taken it. So, for example, um, in one of the translations, uh, based on the word uh, the root, uh, sorry, the root chet mem shin. They're mm -hmm. taking it from chamesh. So the Israelites went out in the fifth, fifth generation. Uh, it's problematic, and our commentators ra raise a similar issue. So, like, if there are six hundred thousand armed people coming out of Egypt, because remember, the six hundred thousand were the men. You know, if you have six hundred thousand armed men, what the hell are they so worried about these other armies for? So. Right. So oh, it's, it's problematic on many ways, uh, in many ways. And, you know, just as where did they get all the materials for the Mishkan? Right. Um, you know, particularly the wood, <laughs> not all that common in the wilderness. But, you know, don't let the truth get in the way of a good story. Uh, <laughs> you know, the reality is they're they're trying to tell a narrative. And so the Israelites supposedly went up armed. Anyway, go on. And Moses took with him the bones of Joseph, who had extract, exacted an oath from the children of Israel, saying, God will be sure to take notice of you. Then you shall carry up my bones from here with you. Remember the dramatic scene in the Ten yeah. Commandments. Sure. Go ahead. They set out from Sukkot and encamped at Etam, at the edge of the wilderness. The Lord went before them in a pillar of cloud by day to guide them along the way and in, and in a pillar of fire by night to give them light so they might travel day and night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart from before the people. Okay, so, you know, we're starting to get a sense of, uh, yes, um, the uh, the exodus uh, or the wandering in the desert did really begin. We're starting to see a number of those el elements. And again, God, as we saw initially, did not take them the straight route because they were going to run into some type of military opposition. But there's more to it. Go on. The Lord said to Moses, tell the Israelites to turn back and encamp before he wrote. Yeah, Piha he wrote between Migdol and the sea before Baal Zephon. You shall encamp facing it by the sea. 
Pharaoh will say of the Israelites, they are astray in the land. The wilderness has closed in on them. Then I will stiffen Pharaoh's heart and he will pursue them that I may gain glory through Pharaoh and all his hosts. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. And they did so. Okay, so what's the second reason that God is leading them the way that God is leading them? To, to eventually uh, tell the, the people that, uh, to tell the Egyptians that he is, that God is the God, is the Lord. But he's setting them up. Yeah. He, this is a setup. Right. He leads them out. We don't really know any of these sites or where they're located. Actually, actually, Migdol, I discovered in 1973. We didn't know it at the time. It, it took uh, later soundings, but they did identify it. It's a huge fortress, a uh, hundred meters per side, right on the road, mm. uh, so that. Uh, it's what they're, as I understand it, it's what they're describing is north of the uh, highway, uh, the modern highway, and and uh, towards, and Balsafon uh, would be in the Barda wheel, the spits of land that go uh, across the northern part of the Sinai okay. along the coast. The point is, he's God is leading them uh, in a certain way, and that's he's trying to entrap the uh, Egyptians. And in fact, the Egyptians fall for it. And when the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his courtiers had a change of heart about the people and said, What is this we have done releasing Israel from our service? And he calls his chariot, and they begin to chase after the Israelites. Right. And we know the rest of the story. Uh, and if you don't, just make sure in Shul on Shabbos to hear it. Um, <laughs> the, uh, but now let's go to um, how our commentators understand this particular route. And we'll see there might be a little bit more about this route than what might be presented here in the biblical text. So I'm looking first at um, the opening line of our parasha, Vayibishalach Baroat Ta'am. Now, when Pharaoh let the people go or sent them away, more correctly, God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, although it was near. For God said, The people may have a change of heart when they see war and return to Egypt. In other words, they'll be overwhelmed. And we'll see how our commentators build on that. But first, I just wanted to present um, uh, a comment by Erica Brown, whose uh, field is really leadership development. She actually did a nice workshop for us here in uh, Metro West uh, pre-COVID. Um, she's written a number of books, done a lot of stuff for uh, the conservative movement, the orthodox movement. I mean, she's a lovely uh, orthodox lady, really, really sweet gal and uh, very bright. And here's what she writes. It's not totally what we're going to cover, but it's a different way of thinking about what the Israelites are facing. Um, somebody else like to read? It's read. too small for me. No. Oh, okay. Okay. Wait a minute. First of all, let me, I can make it larger. Oh, okay. I can try to make it larger. Um, but, um, yeah, I just have to do that. No, that's not what I wanted. Here we go. The other way. Yeah. Here we go. Still a little weird. All right now. Okay, that's too big for me. 
Um, sorry, I just have to move. It's not letting me do anything here. I don't know why it's not letting me do anything here. You got to get rid of the um, book. Yeah, on the left side where it says bookmarks, click the X just to get rid of that. Well, that, that's that's okay. that's just uh, for another text. Oh, okay. Um, what I'm trying to do is get this window. Ah, that's good. Yeah. But you got to move it over. Yeah, that's oh, yeah. Good. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So oh, Carol, um, you volunteered, didn't you? It's okay. Either one. Yeah, it's small for me okay. too on my phone, but I think I can do it. Okay. The wild, the midbar is a place of anarchy, unexpected hardships, and harsh physical conditions that can bewilder and swallow visitors. When the Israelites finally fled Egypt, God said that Pharaoh would come after them precisely because they were going to the wilderness. They are astray in the land. The wilderness has closed in on them. By the way, the word they are astray in the land, Nebuchim him ba'aretz, Nebuchim, confused, perplexed. That's uh, the Hebrew title for uh, Rambam's great philosophic work, Mora Nebuchim, Guide for the Perplexed. Same word. Pharaoh did not think they could go far, imprisoned as they would be by nature. The wilderness closes in on people. The Hebrew term in the verse, sagar, implies a place that treacherously imprisons inhabitants. The landscape locks people in and they do not come out. God used the very same rationale in having them enter the wilderness in the first place. God did not leave them by way of the land of the Philistines, although it was nearer. For God said, the people may have a change of heart when they see war and return to Egypt. So God led the people round about by way of the wilderness. In the wilderness, the Israelites would suffer disorientation and would therefore not be able to find their way back to Egypt, even if they were to change their minds in fear. Remorse and regret have no place to lodge because the wilderness constrains <laughs> the inhabitants, punishing them with its sameness, blinding them to exit routes and clarity. Okay, that was just kind of like a background reading. Now we're going to take a look and see what our Mefarshim have to say. So, um, first of all, got to take a look at Rashi. Go ahead. He's commenting okay. here, you know, even though it was close. Okay, Kikarofu. Although it was nearer, and it would therefore be easier to return by the same route to Egypt. Of Midrashic explanations, there are many. Mechilta de Rabbi Yishmael. Yeah, so now we're going to take a look at what Mechilta de Rabbi Yishmael says. And again, this is just kind of throwing ahead how we're going to look at this whole route <clears throat> that God leads the Israelites. So this is from oh. the Mechilta. Okay. The Holy One Blessed, the Holy Blessed One did not bring them directly to Eretz Israel, but by way of the desert saying, if I bring them there now, immediately each man will seize his field and each man his vineyard and they will neglect Torah study. Rather, I will keep them in the desert 40 years eating manna and drinking from the well, and the Torah will be absorbed in their bodies. Okay, this is a, kind of a revolutionary midrash, because normally, why do we think the Israelites are wandering 40 years in the desert? To kill off the, the generation. They have That's a slave the mentality. Yeah. Why? Because they have a slave mentality. We didn't get there yet. <laughs> You're right, but we didn't get there yet. What what did the um what did the uh, spies do that was so uh, sorry, uh, you know why <laughs> I just gave it away, you know why were the Israelites forced to wander forty years in the desert? 
yeah, one year for every day the spies of the, of the negative were in the land. Yeah. Right. So what did, what did the spies do? They scared the people. They didn't want them to go in. They, you know, they well, said, but that was later. Hardened well, them. Uh, yeah. Um, it basically it hardened them, and basically it uh, caused them to lose faith. Normally, we think of the 40 years in the wilderness as punishment for lack of faith in God before you get to all these other explanations. But here we have another one, which may strike us as a little bit different than the way we learned in Hebrew school, that, or in the Torah itself, for that matter, that why are they wandering 40 years? Um, so they don't just go in and start working. They really have to study in yeshiva first. They really have to learn. They had a they yeshiva in the yeshiva. desert? Pardon me? They had a yeshiva in the desert? Well, actually, where did they get the Torah? In the desert. <laughs> right. But And Moshe teaches them Torah. So, uh, Remember, you know, they were in Barnea for 38 years, so they, they're settled down there where they can study. Right. In and theory. of course, they're surrounded by God's miracles. The manna, drinking from the well, that according to tradition, we looked at that, um, the well that accompanied the Israelites, uh, according to the schut of Mir Miriam. Okay, going on in Ra. But that's just, again, something else to keep in mind. Why are they going 40 years in the desert? Not as punishment, but as an opportunity for them to grow and learn Torah. So uh, God wasn't going to kill them off, the generation that were slaves. Well, it doesn't preclude that possibility, but we'll see as we get there. You know, oh. Susie Rabbi Ishmael didn't want, didn't want to emphasize that. Yeah. But so let's continue now with uh, Rashi. It was pretty much in the same, you know, pretty much what he said before. For instance, the war mentioned in Numbers 14, 45, then the Amalekites and the Canaanites came down, etc. If they had proceeded by the direct route, they would have then turned back. This is evident for what would have been the case if when he led them about by a circuitous way, they said, let us appoint another chief and go back to Egypt. Had he led them by a direct route, how much the more certainly would they have spoken so? Yeah. So basically, you know, if they are going by this um, crazy route and they're saying, ah, it's still better for us to go back, uh, all the more so if they went by the easy route, then they say, oh, let's just, let's just turn around. Forget it. And uh, again, Rashi's just completing his thought here. Go ahead. When they see war. For instance, the war mentioned. No, no, you just read that at I, the bottom of the page. They may have a change of heart. I'm sorry. Peradventure, they cherish a different thought. They change their mind about having gone out and set their hearts in returning. Yeah. So here he's very much emphasizing the uh, fact that they they just would uh, turn around. You know, if they go by a securitist route, if they're going by an easy route, it'll just be too easy. For them to go back and again um you know kind of the uh rashi continues talking about the uh what will happen throughout the desert wanderings their kind of revisionist history of their experience in egypt can i ask you a question about um during the the plagues period were they working as slaves then or was it too tumultuous because of the plagues to be working on anything? So I don't know how long the plagues lasted. Yeah, that I, they forgot how bad it was to be slaves. Yeah, the text doesn't explicitly say. And one would imagine that they weren't really working the land because they were fine in Goshen, we're outside of Goshen, outside of their areas, it was not so fine. And had right. they been out there, they would have been struck, struck in, been stricken by the plagues. And also, you know, 
<laughs> the Egyptians couldn't go out of their homes. The, the Egyptians were caught, uh, so there was no one really to supervise them. There was probably no work being done, and especially if they worked in any way as herds people for uh, the Egyptians. Well, in the end, all the cattle were dead anyway. So <laughs> there was not probably not a lot to do or a lot that anyone could do. And I think, I don't know, when, uh, generally when I read the text, I assume that the Israelites are comfortable in Goshen and there's almost a relief from their uh, enslavement because Egypt has got other things to worry about. Okay, so Rashi's next comment is pretty much the same thing. God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, Kikarov, who, even though it was near, sorry, I have to move everybody, a straight path to enter to the, directly to the land of Canaan. But when they come to the difficulty of the wars of the land of Canaan, uh, they would appoint a new a leader and return to Egypt, as they tried to do a number of times. And he quotes various uh, points in the wilderness narrative where they, you know, say, ah, let's go back to Egypt. It was better there. Okay, now again, getting into what is behind this circuitous route. What is behind God leading them into the desert as opposed to taking them on a direct line? Because let's think of it for a moment. If God is leading them, why would they have to worry about military opposition? After all, Paro and his entire military come chasing after them, and they were scared. But then what happened to the Egyptians? They still haven't really developed faith. Uh, right. That the depth of faith that was needed. It, it was still new. Yep. And here's where we get to this notion of a slave mentality. First of all, this is... Um, Ibn Ezra's comment, uh, not, uh, still in our parasha, but uh, just from the moment before uh, the splitting of the Red Sea, you have this great scene where the Israelites are being pursued by the Egyptians. They, they, they can see that the Egyptians are gaining on them, and they turn to Moses. And, you know, we better we should have died in Egypt. Better, you know, we should be back in Egypt. And, you know, they're... they're, they're what they say is is really one of the great uh, lines of irony. There weren't enough graves in Egypt. Egypt is one <laughs> great big graveyard. Right. It's it's a culture dedicated to death. <laughs> it's it's uh, a wonderful uh, ironic line. Yeah, and <laughs> there's a, there's a lot of humor here because yes, mibli in Kvarimba Mitzrayim. You know, they're they're exactly there are not enough graves of Egypt, and you know they're crying out to God. And then Moses turns to them and says, you know, you know, just, just be strong, stand up to it, and you will see God's deliverance. And then he said, I, I, I comment on this every year. And then he says, Vatem tacharishun, which basically means shut up, you know, <laughs> you know, you be silent. Like they're fetching and fetching and fetching, and they're turning to Moses, and Moses yells at them. And you can imagine Moses looking up at God and going, now would be a good time. You know, like, <laughs> okay, what's happening? And God is like sitting back there in his Eames chair going, Matitzakeli. Why are you yelling at me? Speak to Israel and they'll go. Like God knows what's going on. God is totally calm. The people are anxious. Moshe is anxious and God's in there. What's the problem? Relax. <laughs> I just think it's a little humorous. But now we'll see how Ibn Ezra, kind of like the Midrash before, begins to develop different ideas about what's happening here, what God is doing in leading the Israelites by the desert. Um, do you have another volunteer? Shell? Oh, no, sorry. Susie, it's your turn. Sorry. Stand by and witness the deliverance of yud heh vav -Hey. You okay. will not wage war, but you shall see the salvation which the Lord will work for you this day. 
One may ask, how is it that a large camp comprising 600,000 armed men were afraid of those who pursued them? Why did they not stand and fight for their own and their children's lives? The answer is, the Egyptians were masters over Israel. The generation that left Egypt was trained from their youth to bear the yoke of the Egyptians. They were of humble spirit. How then could they now wage war against their masters? <laughs> the Israelites were lazy and not learned in war. Can you not see that were it not for the prayers of Moses, the, the Amalekites who came with a small number of men would have defeated Israel? Remember, that's coming up in our parasha as well where, you know, it's really Moshe having to have uh, Aaron and Hur holding up his arms. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. God alone, who does great things, and by him actions are weighed. So arranged events that all Israelite males who left Egypt died out, for they had no spirit, spirit to fight the Canaanites, and a new generation with a noble spirit who had never tasted exile, arose after... Getting there. Arose after the generations of the wilderness. I have noted the aforementioned in the account of Moses recorded in the Torah portion, Va'elishmot. Yeah, okay. So as he's referring to an earlier comment. So Ibn Ezra is already picking up that... This generation just can't cut it. So why did you say I spoke too soon? Well, because we didn't get to this yet. <laughs> you were right, but I wanted, you know, I, I'm trying to take this, you know, through suddenly, you know, here's what the text says. I'm taking them this way because we don't want them to run into war. We don't want them to be dismayed. And because I want to set up Paro. But right. as we saw in the Mechilta, there may be some other reasons for God taking them into the wilderness. For the Mechilta, it's, you know, gives them time to study Torah. And now here, it's, they need to be toughened up. This generation cannot lead them in. Right. They need, they, exactly what you said. And exactly, as, you know, we've learned many times. And now we're going to take a look at Shadal, Shmuel David Mutsato. And he builds on uh, Ibn Ezra, he quotes Ibn Ezra, and uh, see what he has to say. God did not lead them, etc. Yeah. God does not some suddenly change people's hearts. Rather, God will guide each person slowly according to that person's qualities and character. Now, Israel, in their exit from slavery, it would not be possible for them to be people of might and courage. C is Ibn Ezra, and to immediately fight against the seven nations and inherit the land. Yeah, so it picks up on Ibn Ezra. They're, they're just not in the psychological condition to be able to fight. Right. Um, you know, and it's, you know, kind of interesting that uh, Ibn Ezra, I'm sorry, that Shadal here is uh, picking up on kind of modern notions you can't just change people overnight you have to slowly train them go on and even if god would give it into their hands through signs and wonders they would not be enough for them to be an independent nation that conducts itself with wisdom and understanding for slaves who suddenly throw off the heavy yoke of slavery from their necks Fear, fear will remain in their hearts, or they will flip to the other extreme and sink into aimlessness and not prepare themselves for political leadership, abandoning the might and understanding that is necessary to establish a free society. So it's not only that they will not have the psychological wherewithal, but they also need to grow and develop and learn how to be independent. Mm -hmm. You know, it's uh, you know, here's God as parent. 
uh, which uh, frequently is an image in the Bible. Uh, that uh, and you have to realize that God as a parent is no different than uh, the rest of us as parents. We uh, spend all of our time trying to make our children to be the last thing we want them to be, independent. <laughs> you know, we, we want them <laughs> to be with us at all times. But no, we want them to be able to be out on their own, make their own decisions. Um, okay. Go ahead. Therefore, God did not want to bring them immediately into the land and into war because their fear when they see war will lead them to choose slavery and return to Egypt. God led them by way of the desert so they could they would be delayed there for some time and slowly learn and acquire the characteristics that they need to conduct themselves by themselves in their own land. Mm -hmm. So there we go. Uh, you know, he's understanding that they need to toughen up. They need mm -hmm. to go to the experience of the wilderness not only so they can face the wars, but so that they can survive as a nation. Right. Pardon me? So they can rule themselves, learn, yeah. what, learn what it means to be independent. Yeah. Of course, he that doesn't seem to be totally giving up on the idea of the uh, Mechelta. Go on. God had another reason for this, and that is that in the great de desert, it was possible for them to receive Torah and mitzvot, all of them as one, and to be schooled in the awe of God and knowledge of his ways, and to be educated in trust of him under God's guidance and that of Moshe, his servant. For if they came immediately to inherit the land, they would disperse each to his holding, and it would not be possible to teach them and instruct all of them as one. And even if they had not been held back 40 years in the desert because of the spies, they would have nonetheless been delayed there for a few months until they received the Torah and mitzvot. All of them, all of them surrounding Mount Sinai, eating the manna, and without the burden of working the land. So, you know, he kind of picks up at the end on the Mechilta that, uh, you know, they did have to learn Torah. They had to uh, and live with uh, God's wonders. So the notion that we have that going into the desert was not just about the punishment. It was not just uh, about uh, tricking Paro, but it was really to allow the Israelites to develop and to grow religiously, uh, politically, and in many ways, that's you know what we would like to think they would have learned in the wilderness. We can question how much they really learned. Uh, well, first of all, the generation dies off in the wilderness. How tough were those who uh, took over? But it is a very interesting uh, notion. Uh, and uh, you know, the sense that the desert was a time of refinement, and we have that in many other uh, places in our tradition. And actually, it's not unknown from other literature or even from our literature that someone kind of has to go into the desert and get prepared. Uh, whether it's Moshe who has to flee Egypt, going into the desert, going to Midian, um, or it's Eliyahu who has to flee from Izevel. And, the, uh, and her prophets, and goes all the way down to the Negev, then all the way down to uh, Chorev, to uh, Mount Sinai. He has to go into the wilderness to get strength from God to go back. Um, and then, of course, uh, for Christian tradition, uh, Jesus will go into the wilderness, and some uh, stories to be tempted by the devil, but it's kind of a place of growth and development. Uh, so it's not an, you know, something that we know elsewhere from uh, Jewish tradition and other traditions. Of course, also we have to recognize as we read um, Yitziat Mitzrayim that its importance is not just, say, as uh, a story within the context of 
ancient Israel's history, but Yitziat Mitzrayim becomes a model for so many different experiences of personal freedom, of national freedom. You know, it becomes the model for what will happen in the Messianic days. Some of the prophets are right in ways of, you know, the coming day of the Lord or the uh, their notion of a Messianic age in which uh, it's kind of like a new exodus. And its inspiration for the world, of course, we know. Uh, for so many liberation movements, the story of the exodus uh, was very, very powerful. One only has to think of uh, slaves here in America and the the uh, hymns and spirituals that draw on the image of the Exodus and its stories. Um, there's an interesting book called Exodus and Revolution by uh, the political science scientist Michael Walzer, which I still haven't finished, just read sections for a class when I was in rabbinical school, and I still haven't <laughs> <laughs> read it, but um, and America itself, as Americans, we have to realize the metaphoric possibilities <laughs> of this story, uh, not just as Jews, because America saw itself as the new Israel, and the language of early American literature is just filled with the biblical imagery, uh, imageries of the Exodus. So there's obviously a lot more in this week's parasha. Of course, the splitting of the Red Sea, uh, Shirat Hayam, uh, the poem that Moshe and Miriam sing. We have the battle with Am Amalek. We have already them running out of food and water. Uh, so this is a remarkable parasha. And uh, we just kind of touched on one little uh, topic within it, but one that you know points to the fact that this whole notion of going into the desert is really uh, not just a punishment, um, not just a trick, but really a way of developing and growing the Israelite people. A 40-year 40, 40 gap year. <laughs> <laughs> yep. For those that are interested, I have an article on Shirat Hayam uh, as a dedication uh, him in uh, the Torah.com uh, this week. So look at the Torah.com, my name, and you'll, you'll see that if you're interested. Thank you. Yeah, it sounded like a very interesting uh, comment. So uh, I'm actually going to probably download it. <laughs> Torah.com, okay. Okay, so Shabbat Shalom, everyone, since we won't see anyone, and uh, they have a good day. Stay well. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh,